Jackal Among Snakes Author, Nemorosus Chapter 71, A Prince's Example At the top of a ridge, five horsemen stared out across the moonlit grassy fields. Their faces were wrapped in simple brown cloths, and baggy burlap concealed steel armor. The shade from a mountain behind hid them from sight. The one at the highest point of the ridge, evidently being followed by the others, was of formidable stature and had bright blue eyes. His helmet dangled from his horse's saddle, bound by a rope. Their eyes stayed locked on a castle. It was a simple thing, a pentagonal stone fort built atop a hill, with a simple yet spacious keep in the center. Knights roamed the ramparts, bearing torches or magic lamps even despite the abundant moonlight. It overlooked a town. The place was quite poor, most of the houses being shanty wood or packed straw. To think that a vassal of House Parban lies so close to Elbrail, their blue-eyed leader said. My prince, there should be no issue in passing. One of the other horsemen spoke. There are no night patrols, and even us royal knights can pass as mercenaries when bearing steel and burlap. I know, replied in tune, tone dismissive. They seem lax, don't they? The knights, prince? One of the royal guards asked. Yes, returned in tune, tone pensive. The most they deal with is probably the average village ruffian. A peaceful existence. And Dune extended a hand out. They watch over this dank hovel, polishing their armor and passing day by day. They might deal with minor disputes, or they might be called to war elsewhere. But here? Dreadfully boring. The royal knights remained silent, leaving their prince to his thoughts. It would be best if someone let them know they are truly at war. And Dune reached down, retrieving his helmet off his horse's saddle. He unwrapped the cloth around his head, and then put the helmet on. It would be better if that person were me, my prince. We are only five, one of the royal knights said concernedly. Rest easy, and Dune assured, voice calm. Someone told me I should be less impulsive and so I thought for a long while atop this ridge. Perhaps she was right. But Elbrail needs a demonstration, and my enemies need to know fear. And Dune urged his horse onwards, descending down the hill they were on. The knights followed without hesitation, such was their duty. When they neared the village, and Dune slowed their horses into a steady trot, scanning the village. He roamed without purpose, it seemed, but the footfalls upon the grey autumn grass were soundless and none of the sleeping villagers roused at their presence. After a time of wandering, and Dune brought his horse to a stop in front of a place where straw roofs were abundant. His eyes roamed for a long moment, and then he nodded. Enter quietly. Secure all the residents the same way. The royal knights dismounted wordlessly, walking around the perimeter of the house. And Dune watched from the outside, still on horseback, as his men signaled each other and entered simultaneously through the house's entrances. A brief scuffle could be heard within alongside a muffled scream. Something ceramic broke within. After some time had passed. Indune came down and moved into the house. The royal knights had the four residents of the home arrayed on the floor, muffled by sheets and clothing likely taken from the house. Two were children, and the other two were their parents. Indune stepped forward kneeling down. I'm going to remove your gag, Indune said, voice passive. Scream, I'll butcher your children. He reached down and pulled the cloth out of the man's mouth. At once, the man began begging incomprehensibly. The most common word being please. Stop talking, Indune said grabbing the man's hair. Answer my question. Under what circumstances do the castle gates open? TT they open when the Lord leaves, when the knights go on patrol, whenever the Lord is traveling. The man babbled frantically. When else? And you and shook the man's head. Use this thing I'm holding to help the villagers, to put out fires, to fire. A good idea. Enough, and you said, releasing the man's head. He stood up, nodding. You want your children to live? Yes, yes, I do. The man shouted at once, and the woman beside him writhed screaming blocked by her gag. Good. Indune pointed to his men. Take the children outside. Indune kneeled again. If you want your children to live. Once this place sets aflame, scream for help. Scream like your life depends on it. But mention me or my men, I'll kill your children myself. Understood? The man started crying, but he nodded frantically. Don't kill them. Don't. Please, I beg of you. Indune came to his feet. Then do as I say. With the children in tow, the royal knights left the building alongside Indune. Mounting their horses once more, the prince held his hand out and a spell matrix swirled in the air. After a second, a geyser of flame erupted forth, immediately consuming the entire home and some of the ones closest to it. Their horses, not expecting such a sudden appearance of fire, reared and rushed away without the consent of their riders. Indune surrendered himself to where the horse led him, and before long they were far from the village. Indune raised his hand and a bit of green light burst from his hand like a firework. The scattered light drifted down like green embers, and as they fell, they gave the animals a sudden and profound serenity. Behind them, the flames started to spread out of control, the straw a natural accelerant and the wood a tremendous source of fuel. It was not long before the corner of the village was consumed in flames. People rushed out of their homes, burning and screaming. Loudest were the screams of the house they'd left. The royal knights were somewhat uneased by the display of wanton arson, but Indune remained calm with his breathing steady beneath his helmet. A. They opened the gate, Prince Indune. One of the royal knights pointed. True to his observation, 
The gate had opened, and a great many riders rushed out. Release those two. Then, Indian gestured towards the children, who kicked and screamed. Such a big fire, they'll need all of their mages to quell this. As though prophesied by his words, some of the riders came to the flames and began casting water magic. It brought a smile to Indian's face beneath his helmet, and he urged his horse onwards after leaving behind a simple directive for his escort. Circle around opposite me. Kill the mages. Once done, wait for me. We'll head for the castle. Indune led the charge back towards the village. Their calmed horses showed no fear towards the flames. The riders from the castle, spellcaster or no, were too distracted by the fires to see others bearing a different uniform. Weaving in their ranks, Indune drew his sword, rushing past a few mounted knights to stab a spellcaster in the chest. The man was pushed back, caught on his stirrup, and Indune pulled free his blade cleanly. The enchanted blade left a cauterized wound. Though a great many knights saw what occurred and attempted to intercept in Dune, the prince merely raised his hand and conjured another geyser of flame. He waved his hand as the spell hurtled forth, creating a cone of fire. What few of the castle's knights not hit by the spell had difficulty controlling their horses, and in Dune continued unperturbed. When in Dune reached the second lightly armored spellcaster, the woman had already been alerted to his presence. As in Dune approached, she held her hand out and conjured a spell. At once, Spears of ice hurtled up from the ground forming a makeshift barricade of bikes. The horse could not cease its charge, and Indune abandoned it, jumping into the air. It impaled itself on the ice, and Indune landed nimbly on the other side. The woman cast lightning magic at Indune, but it slipped off his enchanted armor. The prince rushed forth, stabbing towards her gut. Though the spellcaster conjured a ward, it broke when met with the enchanted blade. Indune pierced her stomach and she cried out painfully. He grabbed her arm and mercilessly pulled her from horseback dispatching her with a stomp to the neck. Without a moment's pause for breath, he remounted and calmed the horse with a spell. He led the animal around the growing flames, where ahead his royal knights had cleared a path for themselves. When Indune sped past them out of the village and into the open plains, the royal knights disengaged, following after him. Indune looked back, watching for more traces of magic, but the royal knights were brutally effective killers and Indune did not watch for long. They sped across the plains, the knights of the castle torn between dealing with the flames and dealing with the intruders. The villagers of the unaffected portion of the town emerged from the homes, trying to aid with quelling the flame using dirt and water to little effect. In Dune and the royal knights entered the castle's open portcullis, the gateman evidently unprepared to shut the gate. Ahead of them, a set of wide stairs led to the main keep. In Dune dismounted, and then yelled out to the knights. One of you, go up the walls and find the mechanism for the gate. Make sure it remains open. The rest of you, stop the pursuers from entering. Leaving with those words. Indune left the horse there and ascended up the stairs leading to the keep. Ahead, two men worked to shut the massive wooden doors of the keep, but Indune stepped forward and pushed them away. They scattered to the ground, and Indune made short work of them with two simple stabs. They were left with smoldering holes in their chests. Indune proceeded into the keep, trampling on the velvet carpet without much care. Blood still dripped from his blade for a time. Three knights rushed down the stairs ahead, each bearing a metal kite shield with a dog on the front and a simple broadsword. They jogged across the carpet and then stood across Indune warily. He towered over the three of them. The prince stepped off the carpet and knelt down, taking it in his hand. He pulled it mightily, and though it eventually tore, one of the knights did stumble. Indune tossed the velvet carpet at them and rushed forth. He grabbed the first shield and thrust at his visor. The man managed to pull his head aside, but Indune kicked his knees and the man stumbled. With a push, the knight was sent a great distance away. Without pause, Indune stepped forward and stabbed the one who'd fallen earlier in the neck, dispatching him. The last knight still on both feet stepped forward and thrust. Indune swatted the blade up with the back of his gauntlet, incautious on account of his enchanted armor. He pulled his blade free of the fallen knight's neck and stepped forward with a straight kick in one fluid motion. The metal boot clanged against the metal shield, echoing out in a deafening ring across the hall. Annoying, Indune muttered. The two knights came to stand side by side, shields at the ready. The prince held a hand out and sent forth a spell. A bolt of lightning struck one's shield and the man spasmed and fell to the floor. Indune decisively severed his head. The other backed away in fear. Indune walked forward casually, then dropped down and swept the knight's legs. The knight fell, dropping his sword. Indune stabbed him in the visor. His struggle ceased immediately. That shouldn't have been that hard. Indune pulled free his blade, and then ascended up the stairs. Once at the top, he was greeted by a sorry sight. The lord of the castle had not had time to put on his armor. He wore naught but gauntlets, a helmet, and boots. His weapon was a halberd. Indune could tell the halberd had been taken from a wall mount, for the thing lay littered on the floor. The lord waited in the middle of the hallway, and behind, Indune could see a decadent bed. This ends here. The lord said. A middle-aged man with fiery red hair. He was probably a cadet branch of House Parban, the prince suspected. Indune removed his helmet with one hand and stepped forward slowly. The lord stepped forward, thrusting at Indune with considerable skill. The prince, though, sidestepped it easily and caught the haft of the halberd in the crook of his arm. He slammed his helmet against the lord's face, 
and the man released the weapon, falling back dazed, after dropping his helmet, Indian grabbed the Lord's leg and pulled him up the hallway, the man barely offering any resistance on account of the blow to his head, before long. Indune entered the man's bedroom. He looked around and saw a woman cowering with a child in her arms. Indune tossed the man on the bed, and he scrambled vainly away, face bleeding. Indune raised his blade, pointing it at the woman. Let this be a lesson to you. This is what occurs when you oppose Indune of Vasca, he said harshly, emphasizing his name. He stabbed the Lord. The woman screamed, and the child cried. Indune smiled. He turned on his heel, retrieving his bloodied helmet. He put it back over his head. Only then did he pull out his blade. He walked out the door slowly. There. Two of his knights came rushing up. My prince, one greeted. The pursuers chasing are all dead. The remainder are dealing with the fire. What now? We leave, Indune said. Few nobles will forget the lesson I taught here today. None are safe, not even Parban's own. Chapter 72 Grandfather acquired. What is this? I'm on human soil not today and already I have you groveling at my feet? Ro asked mockingly. All of our graves party was crowded into his room, and the aged elf himself still sat at his bed, walking stick leaned up against his shoulder. I think it's warranted. All I need is for you to come with me to meet with these people. Keep the peace. Argrave spread his arms out. You want me to help with your business here in Jast? I think you should return the favor first. Where I'm from, we call this a transactional relationship. You owe help to me, Ro refuted. Practically handed all the secrets of Veiden's magic to you, and that warrants some gratitude. You think I'm a fool? Been around too long to be yanked about. This stick here is older than you. Ro tapped it thrice. We've established that it's got a sword inside. It's more a concealed weapon than a stick. Returned our grave, which made Ro frown once more. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't owe you anything. We had a trade. You did me no favors. When all is said and done, you and Ve Iden got more out of the deal than I did. I'm not stupid, boy. Shot back Ro. Our grave shook his head in annoyance. Yes, we've. You're playing both ends against the middle, outlined the old S rank spellcaster, extorting both sides, human and Ve Diamon. For your own needs. You use the books from the Iden to secure liberties in your mage order. Just because that middle is Gerectic key it doesn't change the fact that we're being played. Ro pointed a bent, arthritis deformed finger. That's why you owe me. Argrave said nothing for a time. He considered if Ro was trying to get a confession out of him by presenting speculation as fact. Where's your proof? Argrave denied. Trying to feel out if it was a bluff. You think the Iden wouldn't pay attention to you after what happened on our soil? Ro questioned. We have people keeping tabs on you. We'd notice, naturally, what you did. In the silence, Argrave heard Annalise whisper something to Gilliman, but he couldn't distinguish what it was. Listen, the meeting is this morning, Argrave said with some urgency. There's an A-rank mage there. He chose an unusual method to become an A-rank mage, and he has, minor true sight. Consequently, he might notice either Gilliman or me being out of the ordinary, cause problems. I'm happy to help you after, but I need this now. I don't see how this is my problem. Ro shook his head. Offer me something or give it up. Argrave pushed his tongue against his cheek, brain working quickly. A grating, guttural voice drew him from his thoughts. Ro, do this for me as a favor, Gilliman asked. Argrave turned his head back to Ro, waiting to hear the response. The old elf looked perplexed. He scratched one of the liver spots on his bald head. A favor? Really? Ro repeated disbelievingly. Yes. Gilliman nodded. Fine, Ro grunted standing from his bed. I'll call in that favor now. You have to answer that question I asked you all those decades ago before you were exiled. That one you refused to answer. The sound of Glimmon's teeth grating was audible, and Argrave took a step away, unpleasant memories surfacing. After a few seconds, Glimmon slowly nodded. So it shall be. After Glimmon's answer, Ro looked pleased, and the elven vampire added, but only once the task is finished. Argrave looked back to Annalise and muttered, that's your idea. His interjection? She said nothing in response, merely smiling. Argrave nodded and gave her a thumbs up. Hash. Argrave's party walked across the plains towards a distant riverside village, Carl. Argrave could think of few quests that went there and could not recall a single named NPC in the village. Ro was with them, lagging slightly behind on account of his walking stick. So, what question will he ask you? Argrave spoke to Gilliman, whispering very quietly. The elf's only response was a fierce. White-eyed gaze lined with warning. Argrave held up his hands. Only curious. I just can't imagine anything Ro could ask you, let alone something worth a favor. Argrave pointed with his chin towards Ro. Ro intends to ask a question I loathe enough that he felt it worth a favor, Glimmon said icily. And yet you think I will say to your curiosity simply because you asked? Can't blame me for trying. At least, Argrave shrugged. I've got some curiosity in me. It's in my blood. Not as bad as Annalise, of course, but it's there. Argrave pointed at her. You're overly curious too. She shook her head. But your knowledge has stagnated that desire somewhat, I think. Argrave frowned. He supposed she was right. A large part of why he had contributed so much to the heroes of Berinder Wiki was on account that he loved the discovery process, 
both delving into the mechanics of the game and the lore supporting it. Few other worlds captured his attention so raptly. Berenda seemed almost a real place, back then. Now, it didn't seem, it was. This place, shoddy, Ro called out as though in response to Argrave's thoughts. What are you talking about? Argrave questioned, turning back to the old elf. These roads must have been made decades ago, and they're just flattened dirt. Ro dragged his stick along the road. That city back there, just, it was dense with mana, but beneath it all was bureaucratic corruption and rampant crime on account of mages chafing beneath the lack of support from the government and their organization. Argrave was surprised that Ro had managed to gain such a solid view of the city so quickly, but before he could say anything, Annalise said, yet despite all that, they managed to achieve more than we have. Yes. Ro trailed off head lowering until his jowls breast against his neck. It's vexing. We Vaidimon are physically superior, longer lived, harshly raised, and thrive in unity. Despite that, perhaps it's the environment, Argrave posited. Were the environment the issue, our attempts to establish ourselves on different continents would have succeeded. Patriarchidras was not the first to attempt to invade greener lands. None before him have succeeded. Ro quickly shot down Argrave's half-baked theory. Civilizations here are like moon cycles, Argrave responded seriously resuming the trek towards the village of Kahu. They wax, they wane. You've caught us when we're but a sliver of moon, near absent in the sky. Argrave shrugged. In time, perhaps, that will reverse. You believe humans will resurge, even after the advent of Gerektik Kiet? Ro questioned. Argrave was surprised the aged elf could speak so amiably. Who's to say? Argrave replied vaguely. Ro stepped up to Argrave, walking alongside him. You have no plans for what lies beyond Gerektik Kiet? I take things as they come and you are not certain that what lies beyond will come. The elf followed Argrave's logic. I. Argrave hesitated. Could die, he admitted. All I do is tackle things beyond me. If you've noticed, this body is not so fit for tackling. Argrave shook his hands about, demonstrating his wrists. It's good you realize this, Ro said, uncharacteristically passive. You should not be merely planning to deal with Gerektik Kiet. You should be planning for what happens should you perish. At that, Argrave's breath stopped. He saw the sense in Ro's words immediately, though Argrave knew that his death was very well likely. He took no measures to counteract Gerektik Kiet should that actually happen. His lungs felt tight, and Argrave took a few quick breaths to gain his bearing. What kind of? Argrave paused, then mustered some cheer to say, a bit ridiculous to make plans to die, no? Ro shook his head. I thought there might be sense yet in you. How foolish of me. He looked out to the village. I can feel that mage you spoke of. His manu is unusual, warped, dancing like mist or fog. He did not become an A-rank mage by ordinary means. No, he didn't, Argrave agreed. I don't know how it is in Vaiden, but each A-rank mage is different than the last depending on how they advance. They attune their body to the magic they use. There is only one method of advancement in Vaiden. The spellcaster embraces the ice magics throughout their veins. Some brazen fools discover more, at times, but such is a rare occurrence. Ro shook his head. Despite its bulk, his mana is less substantial than mine. I am confident should things go awry. They grew ever closer to the village. The homes in Karl were made of stone, a rarity amongst villages, but being in such close proximity to the hub of most magical activity for miles around definitely had its benefits. Doubtless some earth-focused elemental mage had made these villages homes of stone in order to earn a quick bag of gold. Good that you're confident, Argrave nodded to Ro, and then looked back to Gilliman. You, chug some blood. Disguise your features. Gliman obeyed Argrave's directive. Ro looked at him perplexedly. What are you? Vampirism is all but indistinguishable if the vampire is fully sated, Argrave explained. Helmut has, minor true sight he channeled most of his mana into his eyes during his ritualistic ascendance to A rank, and it allows him to both cast spells from them and see the truth behind some things. We have two secrets that need to be kept, my association with Earl Abne and Gilliman's vampirism. Hopefully what Gilliman is doing will be enough to trick Helmut's eyes. As for myself, well, it's hopeless. Argrave shrugged and shook his head. You keep strange company. Ro shook his head. You're now part of that, Argrave noted. I am strange. Regardless of the esteem behind the title, S-rank spellcasters are outliers, and thus, strange. Argrave considered that for a moment, eventually nodding. They walked past the first of the buildings in Garol, and Argrave looked about, searching for the people they were to meet. Soon enough, he spotted a few men with exceptionally stocky builds wearing relatively inconspicuous clothes. Argrave could see white steel boots poking out from their robes and approached. Appointment with Elias, Argrave greeted politely as though he was speaking to a receptionist at a doctor's office. The two knights craned their neck to look up at Argrave. Come, one said, leading them away. Argrave followed without complaint. Soon enough, they were led behind a building, where Elias waited with two people Argrave recognized. Baron Abraham and Helmut, Elias sat on a stump and rose when Argrave came into view. It's been a while, Elias greeted, pulling back his hood to reveal his red hair. Probably not long enough, in your eyes. Argrave returned. Chapter 73, 
purple haze all in his eyes. Our grave's eyes lingered on the man wearing reddish brown robes slightly behind Elias, helmet, black hair, a widow's peak, an ur face, and a beard trimmed to a point all lent the spellcaster an appearance of harsh sternness. His eyes were constantly in motion, twisting and beckoning like there was an abyss beyond those orbs. It had been merely another interesting thing when viewing it from the perspective of a player, but now that those eyes were real, it somewhat disturbed our grave, both their appearance, and the knowledge of what they could do. It was difficult to distinguish where, exactly, Helmut was looking, but our grave was certain he had seen something out of the ordinary, for Helmut displayed considerable caution gazing upon them. Perhaps it was Ro, magical titan that he was, or perhaps it was our grave, possessed of the blessing of the god of knowledge. Worst yet, it might be Gilliman, the vampire. Regardless, the spellcaster stepped up to Elias ear and whispered something. Elias frowned as he listened, and then eventually turned an eye back to our grave. Our grave did not know what, exactly, Helmut said. But eventually Elias looked to him and said simply, I won't. There's no need. I strongly advise against that course, young lord, Helmut said insistently, slightly louder. He lowered his voice again. Argrave turned to Gilliman as Helmut whispered to Elias, conveying to the elf he wished to know what they were saying. He wishes to leave, muttered Gilliman beneath his breath. He believes you are a danger, and fears that you have an S-rank spellcaster in your retinue. Argrave nodded, but his question soon turned out to be a waste of time. Baron Abraham said loudly, I also think we should leave, young lord. He raised a hand and waved it at Argrave and his three companions. You said this bastard stopped the Vaidiman invasion. Why, then, does he keep only their company? Because words are stronger than swords in ending wars. Argrave supplied smoothly, interjecting himself into things to speed the conversation up. Things were resolved diplomatically. I was named friend to the Vaidiman. Ha! Huh. Abraham shook his head. More likely you were the puppeteer behind the invasion to begin with. Start something and end something with the same hands. Fabricate glory from nothing, not unlike most in Vasca. Abraham said, voice low. Argrave laughed. Conspiracy theories, now? Baron Abraham, you forget your place, Elias said. Margrave Reinhardt made it clear to me my place was to advise you. Abraham turned. And you're going down a foolish road even conversing with this lowlife. That is my advice to you, lowlife. You're not worth a tenth of him, even were your flesh made of gold, Ro said provocatively, sparking Argrave's panic. Now, let's just... Argrave tried to begin. Is that right? The Baron placed his hand on the pommel of his sword taking a step forward towards the four of them. Blade or spell, he'd be dead within ten seconds if we came to blows. Argrave felt magic stir within the air and took an instinctive step back. Something rushed from Helmut's hands, winding about Abraham like a tether ball. When things settled, it was revealed to be a purple mass of air coiled around Abraham's body. The knight struggled with it, clawing at it with his hands. Argrave recognized what had happened. Helmut chose the B-rank spell, Tempest Grip. The spell, a wind-type elemental spell had been tainted purple by Helmut's unusual magic constitution. The enchantments on Abraham's armor sparked wildly, keeping the magic from crushing him outright. Be silent, Helmut said loudly, not quite yelling. You know naught. You tempt wrath beyond your ken, and should you proceed, I will cast you to the dogs. I would sooner carve your headstone myself than join you in death. Helmut clenched his fist, and the spell matrix shining in his hand dissipated. Abraham collapsed to one knee, his legs braced as though the knight was ready to lunge and seek revenge. He stared at Helmut indignantly, breath quick. Argrave feared that things would continue to escalate. After a time, Abraham stood, running a gauntleted hand through his messy blonde hair. The Baron walked a fair distance away, refusing to continue the conversation. Elias stared at the Baron, saying nothing. One of you has some sense, it would seem, Ro said. But they say if a dog has a fault, it's the master's. Let's not, Ro, Argrave interrupted, voice tense. I have an exercise for you. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. Ro grumbled something inaudibly, and Argrave sighed, rubbing his hand against his face. Well, since the possibility of an amiable conversation has died on the vine, let's get to the point, Elias. Argrave lifted his head up, meeting Elias' gaze. That suits me fine, agreed Elias. But first, Mateth, what happened there? News is inconsistent and vague in Parban. Mateth survived, Argrave said seriously. A lot of people died, all of House Montessai's fleet was destroyed. The harbors have been entirely wiped out, and the dukedom is essentially crippled, but... The duke, Nicoletta, and Mina persist yet. That's... Elias processed Argrave's succinct explanation of a complex situation. Then this rumor of you stopping the invasion, how did that happen? How did you repel the snow elves? Argrave wished to claim it was fabricated, but with three snow elves at his side and Argrave having already confessed being named friend to the Vaidiman, he was not confident enough to maneuver his way out of this one. Worse yet... Ro would probably force honesty from him. I resolved a misunderstanding between Vey Aiden and House Montessai. End of story, Argrave shrugged. Annalise here helped me. He tapped her shoulder, and after a moment's pause, 
she nodded. Most of the credit goes to her. She was the bridge between the two sides. Ro looked back perplexedly but said nothing, to Argrave's relief. Elias sized Annalise up as she stared down at him. They locked eyes for a moment, and Annalise gave a brief nod. It's good that things ended. Then, Elias concluded, turning his gaze away. But I forced a digression. What is it you wanted to speak to me about? The Duke of Elbrail intends to support Vasca, Argrave declared plainly. Elias frowned and lowered his head. The news was similarly disquieting in Elias' company. Helmut looked surprised, and he brought his hand to his beard, stroking it idly. The knights looked at each other, exchanging emotions with glance alone. Even Abraham was pulled from his sulking, and he turned back to them with some anger still present in his posture. And by extension, just, his vassal, will support Vasca as well? Elias questioned further, half lost in thought. That is the natural order of things. Yes, Argrave nodded. And you know this how? You spoke to him, Argrave pointed. Valadrin of Jast. He confirmed some things for me. Good kid. Then where is he? Abraham questioned from far away. Absent, Argrave said after a pause. He had neglected to ask Stain to come along. But I have these letters detailing exchanges between the Duke and the Count, speaking of the war to come. It contains strategy, the like. Here. Argrave reached into his satchel pulling out a tightly wrapped bundle of letters. Elias stepped forward and took it, breaking the string binding them. Elias read through the letters in silence. Argrave kept his eyes on Helmut. He could not be certain of it, for the man lacked both pupils and irises, but he was near certain the man was staring at him. Letters can be forged, Abraham stated. Argrave was rather impressed the man could still be so annoyingly opposed to him even after being threatened by an A-rank mage, his own ally, no less. I don't think they are, said Elias as he read through them. How? Abraham asked incredulously, intuition, you should be well familiar with the Parban instinct. Baron Abraham, Elias reminded Abraham. He looked up at Argrave. Besides, the information contained within these isn't something that can be forged. I'm glad you see that. Even still, I can get Vladrian if you doubt me. Would just take a snap of the fingers, more or less. Argrave emulated the motion. A boy of unconfirmed identity, Abraham said, shaking his head. The man's stubborn adhesion to his own mental deficiencies is very admirable, said Ro sarcastically disguising an insult with compliment. Argrave said nothing so as not to draw more ire, but internally agreed with a comment. Abraham walked away and sat on a stump. So you wish to stop me from entering just? Elias followed Argrave's logic. It could be dangerous for me there. Not necessarily, Argrave pointed to emphasize his point. I think things would be better suited if just came to the aid of House Parban. Instead, Annalise and I have been discussing how we might make that happen. You'd do that, turn just against Vasca? You intend to support House Parban against your own family? Elias tried to confirm. Family, I'm not a Vasca. Argrave shook his head, and most bearing that name do nothing good for the world by continuing to live. Elias seemed taken aback by that statement. Even still, King Felipe is your father. Elias sighed, and then shrugged his shoulders defeatedly. Well, I, I'm not here to teach you morals. What exactly did you have in mind? I'll hear you out, at the very, young Lord Elias, Helmut interrupted, grabbing Elias' shoulder. Let's speak privately for a moment. Elias looked at the spellcaster for a moment then nodded. Hash. What is this about? Elias inquired from within the confines of the warding spell Helmut had created. You should not work with this man, Helmut said plainly. And why not? Elias inquired neutrally. There is a foul blackness within him. Even you opine on his morals? Elias looked away as though disappointed. I know him better than, no, interrupted Helmut, uncaring of Elias' station on account of their privacy. I don't speak of his morals. I speak literally. An abyss resides within his chest. As you know, I see more than most. Helmut pointed to his eyes. You do, Elias nodded. And there's a... an abyss, within our grave? The young lord repeated uncertainly. Yes, I might use more specific wording, but even looking at it is... Helmut dared a glance, then quickly turned his head away. There is a hole within him. It is the touch of something ancient, older than Vasca, perhaps even older than the soil we stand on. What does that mean? Elias leaned in. What exactly did you see? I but glanced at it, and it threatened to consume my mind. Helmut stated, it is a connection to something unknown, perhaps unknowable. There are few words I can use to describe it besides. An abyss, a void. I suspect that whatever it is rests beyond the limits of my mind, were I to guess. It must be a connection to a god. Elias tapped his fingers together, lost in thought. Could our grave be blessed by one of the gods in Vasca's pantheon? No. Whatever resides in him is far older than any of our gods. Helmut shook his head. I must reiterate, young lord be wary of this man, stay far away. If he belongs to one of the ancient gods, their callous disregard for life will surely be mirrored in him. We gain nothing by associating with him. Elias turned his head towards our grave, gaze distant as it was lost in deliberation. Chapter 74, Negotiations. What are we doing here? 
asked Gilliman, looking around at outfits hung on simple carved mannequins. The majority of them were quite grandiose, studded with jewels of all denominations and the made of the finest silk. Why does one generally go to a shop? Answered Dargrave absently, staring at a set of clothes. To buy, of course, and to avoid row, lest he hound you about repaying that favor. Elias has placed things on hold until tomorrow, so Rose's duty is not yet done. Argrave paused, then fearing Gleman's judgment, quickly added, We'll do it in time, of course, but not now. Here, one can only buy frivolities, stated Gilliman judgmentally. Argrave touched a piece of clothing, testing its texture. Pageantry is important if one is to be participating in a pageant. It's in the name, after all. A banquet of nobles is similar enough to a pageant, all lights and colors, only serving to mask the reality of the people behind them. Gleman frowned and Annalise beside him explained, Argrave intends to attend the banquet alongside Elias in order to persuade Count Delbrun to support the rebellion. The boy was undecided, yet you're already planning for what happens if he agrees? He said he needed a day to think. Not a good portent, Gleman argued. Argrave stopped at a suit with puffy parts on the arms and legs, musing, people actually think this looks good. He looked back to Gilliman. Elias will agree. Predicated on what? I think he is somewhat positively predisposed towards me, and Annalise agrees with that assessment. He's a bold person and he likes his family quite a bit. He's also smart enough to realize how disastrous the Duchy of Elbrail supporting Vasco would be. Just is the main pillar of Elbrail's power, if it wavers, Elbrail will likely follow suit. Gleman considered this, then asked, why? If Just swears fealty to Elbrail, the Duchy should be much more powerful than it. I'd place the two at around equal strength. Argave shook his head. Once upon a time, Elbrail was much more powerful than Just. But this place has been growing in strength decade by decade on account of shrewd management and a focus on magic. Argrave pointed at Gilliman. The point to remember, though, Elbrail would be flanked by both the territories of Parban and Just if the city of magic pledged support to the rebellion. The Duke is a coward and would never risk this. But what of Just's honor? They swore fealty to Elbrail. Does this mean nothing? Argrave laughed. No. Such a thing might matter in that winter wonderland you call home, but you're far from Vaiden. Honor and loyalty are the words that noble houses preach but beneath it, the true light shines through, appearances, as long as they appear honorable, nothing else matters, Elbrail has not yet gone public with their support of Vasca, provided this goes through, they never will, Argrave stopped at a neat black outfit with a long yet thin coat, the collar and lapel had been fitted with a resplendent gold fur, and Argrave ran his hand against it, ha, huh, soft, the cuffs were studded with small rubies, and flourishes of gold thread decorated the outfit tastefully, their Vasca colors, but, well, it's hardly their fault these colors work so well together. Argrave looked back to Gleman and Annalise. I think I've found what I'll wear. It will look nice, commented Annalise. I should hope so, said Argrave. Would you like something while we're here? A lovely dress, perhaps? It's only fair. Most of this business regarding Elias was your idea. Anyway, I just supplied the knowledge. You came up with the plan, he gestured towards Annalise. We agreed I should not attend. Annalise shook her head. The presence of Vaidiman at the banquet would only be a detriment to your ability to persuade those present. No personal interest? Argrave inquired. No, she laughed. Shame, Argrave shrugged. You'd look fantastic in something like this. Argrave walked up to a slender white dress on display decorated with lines of gold and silver running along its length. Foremost on its decorations were myriad ambers, each shining against the light. Well, no matter. I should find the tailor, get my measurements done. Argrave walked away. Annalise stared at the dress for some time after Argrave had left, head tilted as she examined it. Her brows furrowed in thought. But then she smiled faintly. She turned her head back at Argrave who'd walked some distance away and hastened to catch up. Hash. A day passed, and Argrave met with Elias once more as was agreed. They met at the same spot, Carl. It was early morning. Ro was present again. They had only managed to get him to come once more because Gilliman promised to answer his question immediately after this meeting. As if in protest, the aged elf was considerably less engaged this time, sitting on a stump off in the distance. After considerable deliberation, I've decided to hear you out. After that, I'll decide. I can't make a judgment without the full picture, said Elias. Okay, said Argrave tiredly. He had spent the entire night trying to learn their, electric eel, spell, but it was considerably more archaic and complex than the vast majority of the spells in the Order of the Grey Owl. He had very nearly grasped it, but it would still take some time. Another sleepless night, perhaps. Well, Argrave rubbed his eyes, it's very simple. You have to get married, Elias. Elias stared at Argrave blankly and Helmut frowned off to the side. Abraham threw up his hands and walked away. Don't worry, Argrave shook his head. You won't be marrying me, Elias. I don't think such an arrangement is legal in Vasca, and it also would be entirely useless. I don't think queer fate did, either. Sorry, what are you? Elias began dryly, Argrave's sarcasm sparking only confusion. Forget it, who would I marry? Lydia of Jast, Count Delbrun's sister, Argrave said clearly. You mean Rydia, 
said Elias. Was it Rydia? Argrave frowned. Quite a gaff, a forgivable one, I hope. Indeed, in some languages, R and L are the same thing. Well, never mind. Argrave shook his head to dispel errant thoughts. Yes, you'll be marrying Rydia of Jast. She is five years Elias senior, Helmut interrupted. Hardly a suitable bride for the heir to house Parban. Twenty-five? Argrave questioned, which Helmut nodded to. It's a reasonable gap, I believe. Even if the young lord agreed, one of Count Delbrun's daughters would be more fitting. The oldest is Nubile. Isn't she thirteen? Argrave said, grimacing after hearing the word Nubile. I know they say if their rage is off the clock, they're ready for their... I'm not going to finish that, Argrave admonished himself. To your point, the age gap is bigger there. Seven years. And I think that would be a rather... Sickening choice, personally speaking. The choice is unimportant, Elias interrupted. Some facts stand in our way. My further is not here. He is the patriarch of House Parban, and he decides these things. I didn't say you'd be swearing your vows on the morrow. Argrave shook his head. Get a betrothal, then get your father's permission. I'm sure he'll agree given the circumstances. This is the best course for your house's future. You'll get a steadfast ally in Jast, and Delbrail will likely come round the exact same way. Elias turned round, hand to his chin as he thought on the matter. Helmut contributed, saying, Elbrail supporting House Parban should this union happen is a reasonable outcome, young lord, he advised. And doubtless Jast would lend Vasca considerable support. Father sent me here to obtain aid from any mages. A union with Jast would facilitate that, Elias reasoned. They have a closer relationship with the Order than any other noble house. Politically speaking, it is a shrewd move, Helmut nodded. But practically speaking, Elias followed, turning on his heel to face Argrave. How do you plan to achieve this? That friend of yours, Vladrian of Jast? Does he have the Count, sir? He's a card, but he's not the full hand. Argrave shook his head. That banquet you were invited to, we should attend. From there, I'm confident in persuading the Count. We could be walking into a cage. Helmut shook his head. Come with him, then. Argrave pointed at Helmut. You're competent enough, Helmut, I know that much. The Count has no S-rank mages in his service, and perhaps two A-rank spellcasters, both of whom are high wizards in the Order of the Grey Owl. Need I remind you that the Order is a politically neutral entity? They won't act. It's still dangerous, Helmut retorted, taking a step back. So mind your step, watch what you eat, Argrave advised. Nothing risked, nothing gained. Helmut pondered this, and Elias clearly waited to hear his thoughts on the matter. The silence stretched out and Argrave turned to look at Annalise, about to question her opinion on the situation. This is ridiculous. A shout broke the silence, and Argrave whipped his head to its source. Baron Abraham stepped forward. All this plausible nonsense is just to get our foot in the door. This bastard's lathered honey on a poisoned blade. Why are we here? He stretched his arms out in exasperation. If Argrave wanted you dead, I'd know. It'd be easy, like crushing a grape, Roe said happily, emulating the motion with his finger and thumb. Baron Abraham. Elias said loudly. You were warned time and time again. You came as an advisor, not as a commander. I will give you two choices, leave, return to Parban, whereupon I will return later and report your repeated disobedience to my father. Elias stared down Abraham, then added the second choice. Your only other option is to remain quiet. I'll speak the truth unto death, Abraham said. He stepped forward, gaze flitting between Helmut and Elias. You shan't muzzle me. I'll return to Parban and tell your father what's occurring here myself, young Lord Elias. The Baron veritably snarled. He walked away from the group, stomping with every step. Ro watched him go, a smile on his face. I apologize for his behavior, Elias said sincerely. He is a man well used to being on the battlefield, giving orders, never receiving them. A terror, my father calls him. But an untrained one. It is as your old friend over there said, if a dog goes bad, it is the fault of the master. I should have handled him better. Humility. I did not think humans could possess it, Ro said glibly. Well, some dogs are born stupid. Too. You must take this into account. He is hot of temper, but not stupid. Elias disagreed, Argrave. We've had our disagreements. So we have, Argrave nodded. Most of which were my fault, admittedly. He found the words easy to speak. It was like admitting someone else was at fault. Still, I think that this would be the best course of action. Elias nodded, stepping forward. This banquet, I'll attend. Where should I go to find you? The night's pawn, Argrave said. I'll be bringing some friends. They'll help facilitate things. Then I shall meet you there. Elias held out a hand. Argrave shook his hand. I'm glad this went well, despite the boisterous one. Chapter 75, Cast Helen of the Empty. Now that is done, Ro said, stepping in front of Argrave and his party. I won't be denied my answer any longer, Gilliman. Do you intend to break your word? Has your time in this place of twisted morals sullied the honor I know you once had? I'll answer, Gilliman refuted, shaking his head. Ask. Then let us go somewhere private, Ro waved. No, Gilliman stopped Ro. Ask here. These two would never cease pestering me if you ask elsewhere. Glimmin the Great, 
brought to heel by children not a quarter his age, Ro mused, fine, it's your business, anyway, I'll give our audience context, then. Ro tapped his staff against the ground and a white magic ward spread out, enveloping the four of them. That day they found you having succumbed to vampirism, your brother's head was crushed, Ro began. Most believe you killed your brother Baron in feral rage after he turned you into a vampire. You always refused to answer. How did your brother die? Despite the ceremony behind the question, Glamon did not seem deeply rattled as he answered. When I woke, Baron apologized for what he had done and killed himself. He used a wedge to lift a boulder, placed his head beneath it, and then allowed it to fall. His death was instant. Then it's as I thought. Ro said. Your brother was coerced into turning you. His children were at risk. I do not blame him. Glamon shook his head. And it matters little. Those responsible are dead. Drus promised me he would uproot them before he sent me away. And I know he kept that promise. Who was responsible? Questioned Annalise. A query which made Dargrave nod in solidarity. The Ebon cult, said Gilliman, his guttural voice carrying a pure hatred that made Dargrave shudder. Aye. They were before your time, girl. Drus slaughtered them like the dogs they were. Ro lowered his head. They were once the Ebon tribe. They discovered Ebon ice. Some people abhor using the stuff for that reason. Argrave stepped forward, then turned to face Gilliman. The Ebon cult existed in Veiden. Gilliman's pupils fell on Argrave, their whiteness seeming especially cold today. What do you mean, existed in? He questioned. It could be a cult of the same name. Darkness, blackness, and other such Stygian descriptors are trendy in cult circles. I hear, but the Ebon cult is alive and well in Berenda living deep in the crust of the world. Glamon grabbed Argrave's shoulders, which dredged up some unpleasant memories and made Argrave freeze. Describe them, he said insistently, pulling Argrave closer. Annalise put her hand on Glamon's wrist. Let go, first, she said. Glamon took a deep breath and then released Argrave. Forgive me, I need to hear their descriptions. Well, Argrave rolled his shoulders, still feeling a soreness where Glamon had grasped. They're a multiracial group, which is perhaps their most inclusive trait. They dwell in the old dwarven cities, whose creators have long ago migrated deeper into the earth. They use necromancy, shamanic magic, and blood magic, all of which they are masters at. In truth, they are more a nation than a cult, a religious state beneath the earth. What are their ideals? What do they worship? Glamon said impatiently. A false god, Argrave shook his head. They're trying to turn that falsehood into reality. Not that that's even possible. His name is Motsar, the Castellan of the Empty. I'd say he's a spellcaster at Rose level. A bold claim. Snorted Ro. You're right. Mozart is probably stronger. Argrave nodded. Shamanic magic is a pain. After all, Ro raised a bushy brow, gritting his teeth. Glamon turned his head away, silent. When the awkward silence stretched out, Argrave followed up, asking, What? Does that name mean anything to you? It's unfamiliar, Glamon said musingly. Ro? Sounds like nonsense to me. Cast Helen of the Empty. What does that mean? Did he go to an open field and declare himself its governor? The S-rank spellcaster shook his head. I did not review what was taken during the raising of the Ebon tribe. Patriarch Idris might know better. I can inquire. Cast Helen of the Empty could mean a lot of things. Empty meaning empty people, or meaning void. Hard to govern either, I'd suspect. We can ask him when the time comes, if indeed he's amenable to conversation at that time. Ask him? What does that mean? Glamon demanded. He has to die, eventually. He'll cause problems in the future. Argrave declared, this cult rivals Vasca in power. They've done us a favor by going to the dwarven cities, deep underground, but we still have to bury them. We have to make sure they never come out of their holes. Argrave shrugged, then added, in time, of course, we have other priorities. Do you have a plan for every step until Gerectic Kid manifests? Ro asked curiously. I do, Argrave nodded. I have a very, very busy schedule, which scarcely offers time even to sleep. I've divided it into phases, recently. First, I solidify my power and deal with immediate problems, like Vasca, for instance. We're on that phase, Argrave pointed to the ground. Second, I gain support and alliances. It'd be impossible to persuade the human world of Gerectic Kiet's existence presently, especially with an all-consuming civil war occurring. We'll have to wait for Gerectic Kiet to make itself known, and believe me, it will. And the third? Queried Ro. I'm become death. The destroyer of the destroyer of worlds. Argrave held his hands out in faux grandiosity. We end Gerectic Kiet. This won't be a battle. It'll be a war. Ro gripped his staff tightly. You have the odd and decidedly dangerous habit of rousing my blood, Argrave, he said. It was the first time the old elf had said his name, Argrave was sure. Most times in anger, and now, in vigor, I suppose. Argrave laughed. Let's hope it persists for three more years. You'll need it then, not now. I'm aware, boy, the elf reprimanded. Now. All this talk has reminded me of the duty that the Patriarch has given to me. We've tended to your needs, and after hearing your little speech, I can concur it was worth my time. That said, my task strengthens Veiden, and your aid is long overdue. Then I suppose I am at your disposal. 
provided this won't take too long, Argrave nodded. That depends on your capabilities, Rose said, dispelling the ward around them as effortlessly as he had created it. Hash. Do you bring a library everywhere you go? Questioned Roe as he stepped into their dormitory. Books here, books there, books on the bed, books on the chair, he rhymed. I shouldn't be surprised. You seem the type that would like to own books for the sole purpose of decoration. Books do look nice, but I'll learn all of these eventually. Argrave picked up a spell book and waited for the rest of his party to enter before shutting the door. It'll merely take some time, mmm. If your willpower doesn't fail first, your memory will, Roe disagreed. He moved some books off a chair and sat down, letting out a huff of air. He leaned his staff against the table. I'm not an old man at the cusp of losing his mind. My memory is good, Argrave countered. So, things have been settled with Elias thanks to your help. What could the unfathomably powerful S-rank mage want with a weak and altogether not helpful me? Argrave sat down adjacent to Roe. Frankly, I can't believe you're here. Don't you have important functions in the Iden? Yes, but I hate doing them, Roe said blatantly. His gaze wandered to Annalise and Gilliman who took their seats at the table. Patriarchus chose me specifically for two reasons, of everyone in Veiden, I've come to understand enchantments the best. Ro held up one finger, and two, he wishes to pass some untraditional reforms, shall we say, and doesn't want my meddling. Despite knowing that, you're here? Argrave asked curiously. I get tired of making sure people don't hurt themselves. Ro shook his head, seeing Argrave's incredulous expression. He added, you try holding the line against the younger generations for hundreds and hundreds of years. There's only one me, but they keep making more damned babies. Hard to see the value in life when you realize it's a renewable resource. Time was I had some ideological allies in Veiden, but I've outlived all of them. Ro shook his head, and then waved his hand as though showing something. Besides, Drus is reasonably intelligent. He won't ruin things too much, and I can fix what he does when I return. I see. Argrave didn't think too deeply into the matter, now that Ve Iden had ceased its progress into the mainland, his business with them would be done for a time. You mentioned enchantments earlier. Is that related to your business here? I. Ro tapped his finger against the table. Our attack on that city. Mateth, was it? It was illuminating. Did you have a moment of epiphany where you realized the foolishness of war? Argrave asked trolly. That would be the best outcome. Embrace pacifism. Live peacefully. No. What we realized was the foolishness of the way we warred. Ro shook his head. Some mages tried attacking the enchanted walls with magic, you know. Ro gestured to Argrave, then continued bitterly, the spells rebounded, exploding in the ranks of our own men. Dozens dead, so I'm told. Yeah, House Montesai is, well, was, strong, Argrave amended. Their walls have never fallen, and their navy had never been beaten before. Some say their sigil should have been a golden turtle. But they Iden annihilated their navy, at that, at least. You can take pride. Your extremely poorly timed invasion was well done. What does it matter whether their navy had been beaten before? To Ve Iden. They're all the same. Enemies to be conquered in time. All the same. With that approach, Ve Iden's bound to fail. There's a reason I killed your druids, Ro. Intelligence is paramount. Argrave placed his elbows on the table. Know thyself, know thy enemy. A thousand battles, a thousand victories. Victorious warriors win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win. He spoke acting up the part of the sagely scholar for his own amusement. I don't care to hear your platitudes, Ro shook his head, and knowing our enemy is precisely the reason why I am here. Will you keep speaking vagaries or get to the point? Gilliman placed his arm on the table. H-M-P-H. Impatient as ever, Ro glared at Gilliman. No. You like to speak too much, I know that well. Those whose words are worth hearing should make them heard, Ro responded to Gilliman, then turned his gaze back to Argrave, putting it plainly. We need to correct our insufficiencies in comparison to humanity. All right, Argrave nodded. You've still yet to tell me what to do. Can't you extrapolate things? Must I spell everything out? Ro shook his head. I wish to know of enchanted architecture of note. I intend to visit and examine it. Furthermore, I must more closely examine illusion magic and enchantments. You taught V. Iden how to create low-level enchantments, but none of those are capable of what was achieved at Mateth. Ro leaned in. It is not enough. V. Iden must be strengthened. This serves your interests. 2. We will aid you against Gerektik Kiet. Then perhaps you should have been nicer to Elaine, Argrave said, a faintly amused smile forming his face. I can't be your tour guide, nor can I give you all the secrets you need. She can, though. I did not expect one so weak to hold a powerful position. But she won't help now, no question, Ro followed. No, she'll have a question, I'm sure, Argrave disagreed. The question will be, how much can you pay for her help? Drus has given me the liberties of using the Iden's coffers, if need be. Ro stated as though it was the natural course of things. Then your answer to that question should be a hell of a lot. Argrave smiled. If you're nice, I'll try and mark down the price. I think I can civilize you yet. Fortunately, I intended to meet with her shortly. She'll be coming with to the banquet, and I need to invite her. 
Argrave stood up from his chair. If you'd like, you may come along now. Two birds, one stone. Chapter 76, Proper Eating. Dusklight washed over the city of Jast. The orange giving the somber city an amber hue on its black stones. The towers seemed less dark and foreboding as high as Argrave was, though he was not fond of the stronger winds here. I'm done, Annalisa's voice broke his thoughts. Argrave turned, feeling some gold fur rub at his cheek. He wore the fancy black outfit he had had riddled a few days ago. It had taken some extra money to have it done in such a timely fashion, but he was largely satisfied with the results. And Argrave pressed her further. The rest of the company gathered round, Elaine, Stain, Elias, and Helmut. Gleman was present, too but he did not need to move from his spot to hear Annalise. Everyone save the two elves wore very elaborate clothing. Stain's outfit was still the tight-fitting white one he donned when visiting Elias, and the young lord of Parban wore his house's colors. Elaine had donned a simple but vibrant crimson dress that seemed to meld with her hair. She most often wore the baggy grey robes, but in this dress, her statuesque figure was especially evident. I scanned the Count's estate thoroughly, Annalise began. Gaze jumping from person to person as she recounted her experience scouting with druidic magic. Guards patrolled the outer walls and garden, but no more than usual. None of the rooms seemed to have any large gathering of troops. Of the areas I was able to explore with my pigeon, none of them seemed to be anything more than well prepared for a banquet. I cannot account for secret rooms or hidden compartments, but the Count is not overtly preparing to take action inside. I seriously doubt my brother would violate your right as a guest. Stain spoke to Elias. People would be speaking of it until the end of time. He can't have that. People can only speak kindly of Jast. Elsewise he'll toss and turn in his sleep, crying and moaning in twisted agony at his sullied honor. You're doing a lot for this to happen, Valadrian, spoke Elias to Stain. Are you sure of it? I won't fault you if you renege now. This is why I hate goody two-shoes. Argrave dialogued internally. They always try to take less than what they need, even at their own detriment. Don't give him an out, you fool. He wished to say, but Argrave was not genuinely concerned. He expected Stain's answer and it came just as he thought it would. Call me Stain. It's the name I chose, the one I want, he insisted. After tonight, Valadrian won't be any more. If it'll help this little deal work out, I'll formally renounce my heritage. I'm sure Count Delbran will leap forth like a dog towards a treat at the prospect of removing me from his family. Bastard. Uh, no offense, he quickly added towards Argrave, having recently discovered his identity. None taken. Argrave shook his head. All right. So, seeing no immediate danger, I think it'd be best if we decided on a plan as to what should be done once we're inside Del Brown's estate. We just need to get a private conversation with the Count. Elias shook his head. We play it by ear. No, we don't. Argrave quickly refuted. Our ears aren't capable of much thought. This is too important to delegate to an organ which some people live without. The stakes are a lot larger than you can see, and I'm not talking about the beef which we might find served in these gilded halls. Elaine snorted, but most others were unamused by Argrave's pun. Firstly, it's imperative that we stick together. We can function better if we remain closer to each other, and in the event that something unsavory is genuinely waiting for us in the banquet hall. Argrave bunched his hands together. Strength in numbers, no? Moreover, we can't say when or where we'll encounter Delbran, and so we all need to be by each other. The Count is sure to greet us, Elias argued. He is the host, and we are the guest he specifically invited. Do you think it would be prudent to show his face if he genuinely intends to move against you? Elaine asked. I see, now. Why Argrave asked me along. I'm a shield. The Count won't act against Elias easily if he risks offending the branch manager of the Order in Jast. No, not a shield. Just your presence with Elias gives a lot of credibility to our offer. And now, Elias owes you a favor. He's rather rich, if you didn't know. Argrave tapped his shoulder. Look at this outfit. Silk and white, gold threads. Can't have been cheap. You take many liberties, putting the young lord in debt to another criticized Helmut. What can I say? I'm a free-spirited man. Argrave deflected. Elias waved a hand. It's fine, Helmut, he interjected. All right, say the Count doesn't arrive. Say he's not even present. What? He is present. Annalise shook her head. I have seen him wandering. Elias rubbed his fingers together. How do you know what he looks like? Argrave described him. Ashen hair kept slicked back, middle-aged, tall, orange eyes. And how does Argrave know? Elias prodded further. The Count scarcely leaves his estate let alone just. Argrave quickly supplied, Stain told me, placing his hands on the teenager's shoulders. I did. He looked at Argrave, then quickly caught on. Oh, right, I did, he said with certainty. Indeed, Argrave nodded, quickly pulling free his hand. And to answer your earlier question, Elias, the beauty of a banquet is that other people will be in attendance. Most prominently, the local nobility of just will be present. It takes but a few pointed inquiries to incite their own curiosity, soon enough, they'll be mirroring our own sentiments. Argrave put his hand to his chest. Why isn't the host present? When will the host be present? That sort of thing is insulting to the nobility, as you know. Might be they'll make a fuss for us. Elias bit his lip, thinking, 
then nodded. It seems a reasonable solution. I don't think I would have been able to come up with that on short notice. Perhaps it was naive of me to think that people were fundamentally unpredictable. Of course, if they are fellow conspirators working with the Count, nothing will come of it. Argrave shook his head. That alone should tip us off. It would be a good warning bell. Then is that all? Elias questioned. No, Argrave shook his head. I'll be doing most of the talking. It's what I'm good at, as I'm sure you agree, but this next part is very important, because he'll likely be seeking you out for responses. Argrave stepped forward, pointing at Elias' face. Do not allow him to decide at a later date. He must decide on this betrayal at this banquet. Elias looked up at Argrave, meeting his gaze. Why? You would make a terrible merchant. Argrave shook his head then held out two hands to represent two examples. Let's say you have two buyers of your product. One offers a very good deal. You know, however, the other buyer might be capable of offering even more. What do you do to maximize profits? Elias mused, and then bitterly answered, I would tell the other buyer about the good offer, trying to get more out of him. He shook his head. You think the count will go to Elbrail, or perhaps even Vesca, and look for a better deal? Precisely, Argrave tapped his temple. Like I said, I'll be talking. I don't want you botching this entire thing by saying something foolish. If you're unsure, consult me. Don't do any ear playing or gut following. Think with your gut and you're acting out of your ass. Helmut shook his head in disapproval at Argrave's insolent words, but Elaine seemed quite amused. A silence stretched out as Argrave thought of more he could say, but he came to the conclusion that there was nothing more to add. Argrave stepped away, shooting his cuffs and straightening his coat. I hope the food doesn't blow. I hate fancy dishes. Is there nothing more? If so, we should probably head for the main gates. Helmut commented. Some few guests have already arrived, noted Annalise, looking out across the hill leading from just up to Count Del Brown's estate. I will remain here, keeping an eye on things with my druidic magic. Should anything seem awry, I will fly into the banquet hall and perch on someone's shoulder. Be careful, Argrave cautioned. If your pigeon is shot with a quarrel, God forbid, there will be a good deal of backlash. Best I suffer some than let everyone be unwitting of what is coming, she rebuked. If that's your choice. Argrave shook his head. All right. If there's nothing more. Elaine raised one hand. Do you need nothing from me? Should I merely stand around looking pretty? You'd have no difficulty with that, I'm sure. Argrave complimented smoothly. I gave you no direction because I have no issue with any interjection you might have. Unless it's a deliberate sabotage, of course. That would not be ideal. No, you have my full support. She shook her head. This matter with that elven spellcaster, Ro. The deal is not yet finalized but this could be huge for me. I have to thank you for bringing him to me. I thought you might like that, Argrave nodded. It's no trouble. We can talk of it later, if you wish. For now. Let's go, shall we? Argrave spoke to everyone. Chapter 77, 1% Argrave and his entourage of well-dressed companions stepped past the open set of gargantuan carved marble doors, entering into the banquet hall just behind their footmen. Two sets of stairs branched to either side leading down below into a veritably sparkling room. Their escort stepped to the balcony atop the stairs, announcing, Now entering, young Lord Elias of House Parban, heir to the Margravate of Parban, Lady Elaine of Vibo, young Lord Valadrian of Jast, and Argrave, son of King Felipe III. Argrave scratched his cheek as most gazes within the hall turned to them. Perhaps the title son of King Felipe III apostrophe had been intended to acknowledge his bastardry, but it seemed far more grandiose than Argrave of Vasca. Helmut had been entirely excluded from the introduction. Perhaps it was because of his relatively base-born status, or perhaps he was simply included in Elias' retinue. Argrave's gaze wandered around the grand banquet hall belonging to Count Del Brown of Jast. The player did not often have cause to come here, so the place was mostly unfamiliar to him. The wide and open hall was a vainglorious testament to the power and wealth of House Jast. The place had an air quite similar to a basilica, though perhaps that could be solely attributed to the two prominent colors, white and red. The room was near fifty feet high and silver chandeliers bearing bright red candles illuminated the room much better than they had any right doing, most likely, they were enchanted. Marble pillars held up the ceiling, lined up all along the side of the rectangular room. The center of the hall was empty, occupied only with some chatting guests. The birch tables had been placed against the walls and were already filled with food, covered partially by red cloths. Vibrant crimson banners covered the windows, elaborate white suns embroidered in their center. Jast's heraldry. Obsequious servants replaced what was taken and tended to the guests ably. Though they were some of the first few to arrive, the hall was already quite filled, and curious eyes watched them readily. After a brief scan, Argrave could not spot Del Brun. These places make me nervous, Elias muttered to Argrave. Do they? Argrave asked rhetorically. He stepped towards the stairs, continuing, Don't let it bother you. I can't hold your hand, you realize. Don't know what it is. The big crowds, the open spaces. Well, Banquets and balls have their fair share of tragic endings, Elias mused. Maybe it's only reasonable to be nervous. I know why it bothers you, Argrave said, 
placing his hand on the rail and walking down the rightward flight of stairs as he assigned names to those present. You care what people think about you. Well, he paused, then said defensively, everyone does. There will always be some, sure. It's never pleasant to be hated. It generally only leads to sadder days. Argrave glanced back. You can care less about what they think, though. How? Huh? Elias questioned. View things with a larger perspective, Argrave stated simply. Me, or you, or anyone in this room, we live relatively meager existences. We'll live, we'll do things, and then we'll die. First, we'll die physically. Then, as time passes, people will forget us, and we die spiritually. On this plane, at least, Argrave added. Who knows what happens after? I don't. Your solution for combating anxiety is to contemplate death? Elias frowned as they came to the final steps before the banquet floor. Recognize the unimportance of your actions, Argrave urged. Being disliked by another is nothing on a cosmological scale. They came to the banquet floor. Already, some people stepped towards them. Elaine asked Argrave, you truly believe this? Of course not, Argrave said incredulously. My vying heart battles my logical brain, and off twins, I find. I wouldn't be doing this if I thought my actions didn't matter. Rather, I plan to leave an indelible mark before I leave this earthly realm if indeed I leave it at all. Living forever is not so far-fetched for one of my talents. You're a real headcase, huh? Stain mused. It's a joke. I'll probably die young, assured Argrave. He watched Elias, who fidgeted noticeably less. Argrave had given that little monologue only to ease his nerves, and by his estimation, it worked splendidly. There was a small group of people headed their way, and Argrave stepped forward, assuming the role as their leader. Look at this, he said levelly. So many beautiful people so busy looking so good. Let's mingle, shall we? Follow, and remember, our host is not present, and we must ask why that is. Argrave greeted those approaching with a convivial smile, assuming a neat dignity that integrated itself naturally. While a discerning viewer might comment that Argrave lacked noble graces, it proved to be no barrier to his inclusion in the conversation, and he very quickly drew the rest of his company into the fray. Hash. Count Delbrun, a tall, ashen-haired man with somewhat animalistic orange eyes, looked through what appeared to be a simple glassless window. If one were to peer through on the other side, though, they would see only stone. It was an illusion enchantment of the highest order, and the window itself was so small that it did not draw much attention even should the magic fail. Few save the Count of Jars knew of the existence of these windows, spread throughout the entire estate. Sights and sounds both passed through the portal, and the hall was so spacious that voices echoed well. The Count watched an extraordinarily tall black-haired man converse with a very sizable crowd of people, his every word drawing them in. Delbrun watched the man with such scrutiny it was as though he was trying to decipher how a magician performed a magic trick. He listened to his words just as thoroughly. Eventually, he closed his eyes and nodded. He stepped away, moving through a confined passageway of marble poorly lit by magic lamps. He pushed on a wall, and it flipped open. An empty bedroom lay beyond. He made sure the hidden door in the wall was in perfect alignment. Then he moved to pull a string beside his bed. Just outside the door, one could hear the faint ringing of a bell. Some time passed as the Count removed his white, silk investments. After a few moments, Three knocks came at the door, and then someone entered. A servant waited. Fetch me something in a muted red. Delbrun commanded naturally. My younger brother is here, and I do not care to match with him. At once, Count, the servant bowed, then stepped off into another room. Hash. Dot you have been pleasant company thus far, and if you might allow me to step outside my bounds and inquire about something of a political nature. Good sir Argrave, I would like to ask a question of you. A well-dressed man spoke. He had rather well-groomed facial hair perhaps to accommodate his quickly balding head. The intent of the question is the important part, Argrave raised a brow. No need to stoke tempers at a pleasant banquet, yes, we're all waiting for our host to arrive, and I'd prefer not to have him come to some petty squabble regarding the civil war. Many present agreed, taking drinks from their glasses. As Argrave had come to discover, this place was a banquet mostly in name alone. The food went largely untouched, and the majority of people were standing and speaking. Argrave was veritably surrounded by a wall of silks and suede so entrapped he was in well-dressed people. His company had been pushed to the fringes of the crowd. Yes, of course, I agree fully, the man returned. I simply wished to inquire about rumors abounding, their origins in Mateth. All present paid attention, waiting for our grave's response. Mateth, is it? What do you wish to know? Yes, it's true. The walls are truly a hundred feet tall, and the seafood is unmatched. A mixture of fake and real laughter spread out in the crowd. Someone offered our grave wine but he acted as though he didn't notice. It wouldn't be prudent to drink here. We wished to hear about your role in the invasion. A woman spoke up. I don't recall invading Mateth, Argrave deflected with a smile. I've heard Duke Enrico calls you the hero of Mateth. And a good deal of people tell me that you came from Mateth. I came from Mateth to here. Yes, Argrave nodded. So it's true? The initial well-groomed questioner asked. You stopped the invasion with the help of Tower Master Castro? I wasn't in Mateth when the invasion was happening, 
Argrave shook his head. It's hard to end an invasion when you aren't at the site of the invasion. Unless, of course, people think I sailed from the shores, into the frigid seas, and set foot on the Snow Elves' homeland. A bit far-fetched, isn't it? I cannot make sense of this. Someone shook their head. Why does the Duke praise you, then? Argrave sighed as though in remorse. It all stems from a misunderstanding, you see. Master Castro initially came to Mateth seeking me out, and, a click echoed out across the banquet hall, and Argrave's head turned to the side, seeking its source. The door across from the main entryway slowly opened, and a servant stepped out, coming to the balcony. He opened his mouth, beginning the word announcing, but the Count's hand grabbed his shoulder silencing him. Count Delbrun stepped to the balcony. He wore a pleasant dark red outfit, lined with threads of white and silver links. His back was indomitably straight, and his grey hair was neatly slicked back. Shimmering jewels lined his fingers, a testament both to his wealth and his desire to display it. Everyone, Count Delbrun's voice thundered out. His voice was deep and powerful, yet it had a certain tenseness to it that made each word seem measured. It brings me great pleasure to see you all assembled here today, giving welcome to Elias heir to the Margravate of House Parban. I apologize for my tardiness. Unexpected issues kept me. His eyes scanned the room. Though this banquet may seem to have political undertones, I hope that everyone is willing to set aside whatever allegiances or doubts they may have of the current state of the realm and enjoy a night of fine conversation and pleasant accommodations. He clasped his hands together, and dipped his head slightly. When the sun fades beyond the mountains, the banquet doors will open, and anyone may roam the gardens. House just has been maintaining them for hundreds of years. Utter trash. He had the garden redone last year, Stain commented quietly to Argrave. Uprooted the trees Armand planted. For now. Delbrun continued, please enjoy the food and drink. I have scheduled some musicians for later. You may look forward to that. I thank you for welcoming me into your home, Count Delbrun, Elias called out. I offer a toast to our host. I am glad of the opportunity to give you thanks, he raised his wine glass. The rest of the crowd mirrored Elias' toast, then took a drink. Elias looked to Argrave. So. What now? Argrave watched as Count Delbrun stepped down the stairs. He came, as I expected. We should go and greet the host. It's only polite. Just like that? Elaine asked. Just like that, Argrave confirmed. He took the wine glass from Elias' hand and placed it on a nearby table. Come on, the gardens will open soon, and undoubtedly we will have our privacy with the Count then. Chapter 78 One Job Argrave stared out beyond the hedge maze. He was just tall enough to see over the well-trimmed bushes. Night had fallen bathing Count Delbrun's estate in pearly moonlight. The wind had grown colder yet, and Argrave was glad of the golden fur lining his lapel and collar. He pulled his gloves a bit tighter and turned around, watching the last of his company for the banquet take their seats. Count Delbrun sat at one end of the table, back straight as an arrow. They had moved to a marble terrace just beside the banquet hall. An abundance of greenery made it quite the secluded place, though the plants were kept well enough that the privacy appeared deliberate. The tables and chairs were a grey stone and had been marked with hand-carved floral designs. Argrave pulled back the chair opposite Delbrun, taking his place at the head of the table. His gaze quickly jumped between Elaine, Stain, Elias, and Helmut, finally landing at the count. The man reminded Argrave of Duke Enrico, somewhat, a cold, business-like atmosphere. Though Delbrun seemed to lack what little warmth the Duke had. To begin with, I'd like to thank you for giving us your time, Argrave began amiably. Delbrun stared at Argrave in silence, only blinking and waiting. Stain tapped his nails against the stone table, biting his lips in the quiet terrace. Elias seemed to wish desperately to interject, but he only watched Argrave, eyes pleading. Being met with all the response a statue might offer, Argrave shifted in his seat. Delbrun was not especially involved in Heroes of Berinder, so it was difficult to get an accurate bead on his personality. The player had but a few brief interactions, most of which were insubstantial, in the game. He had remained neutral with Elbril until the war was all but finished. That told Argrave only of caution. Argrave tilted his head, meeting Delbrun's gaze. Perhaps you would like me to skip the niceties and get to the point, Count Delbrun. This got more reaction, but only just. The Count raised an eyebrow. Doubtless you're curious about why Elias would come here. He has no good reason to accept your invitation, ostensibly. Argrave leaned forward and laid his arms on the table. I'll lay it out plainly. This civil war is rather concerning, with Mateth crippled as it is, just stands to be the primary military power at the edge between the north and the south. The Count held up a hand, a spell matrix swirling about. Argrave knew the Count was a B-rank mage, and so tensed, prepared to move at but a moment's notice. Looking at the spell, Argrave quickly deduced it was a warding spell. A bubble expanded outwards enveloping them. Some letters of mine were missing. Delbrun's gaze fell on Stain. Something would come of it, I knew. Aha, Argrave laughed awkwardly. I hope you won't pay that any mind. A necessary act. Is your intent to coerce me, Argrave of Vasca? Delbrun's orange eyes switched back to Argrave. 
Not a hint of fear on his expression despite his words. You bring an S-rank spellcaster into my domain. As a mage, you can't be ignorant that people would take notice of a veritable monster walking about. You arrive at my banquet unannounced. If you do, intend to coerce. He closed his eyes and shook his head. Dot imprudent. Elias reacted strongly to the word coerce, adjusting in his seat and looking urgently to Argrave. Perhaps contrary to Elias' desires, though. Argrave did not immediately deny it. Argrave rubbed his thumb against his palm. You're taking a course that's against the best interest of the realm. That's why Elias and I are here today. Using the phrase the realm made his words ambiguous, and deliberately so on Argrave's part. The realm might mean Vasca, or it might mean just. Argrave trusted that uncertainty would get under Del Brown's skin. The Count took a deep breath and exhaled, gaze now locked on Argrave unblinkingly. Argrave proceeded after a moment's pause. Perhaps taking a course is the wrong term for this. Argrave held his hands out, open-palmed. You stand at the beginning of a path, or, better yet, a crossroad. Argrave amended quickly. Your liege lord, El Braille, fears the might of Vasca, and has decided to accept the meager benefits thrust upon them by King Felipe III. As of now, you obey the words of your liege, unheeding of the righteousness of the situation. I cannot fault you for this, you swore an oath of fealty, and you are a man of honor. Argrave gestured towards Delbrun, expression serious. Elias, however, has a proposal for you. Elias opened his mouth to speak, but his voice failed on account of his prolonged silence. He cleared his throat and continued, saying, Correct. I believe it would be in everyone's best interest to forge a union between House Just and House Parban, by way of myself and a woman of your house, your sister, Rydia, perhaps. The Count did not relax, but Argrave thought some of the tension in his face fell. He looked to Elias, letting the silence hang once more. Argrave waited patiently. Delbrun spoke evenly. Noble houses rise and fall with the passing of time. House just is five centuries old. We are the oldest house in Vasca, barring the royal family itself. Over centuries, this place rose from a barren wasteland of black stone into a city of magic famed across the realm. Why? Delbrun leaned in. As one house of wizards surrounded by a thousand others in this land of dense magic, my house learned well when to fight and when to endure. Powers great and small all fell, but when the king chose a count of this burgeoning city, he named it just. Delbrun leaned back. I see no need to stick my neck out. In times like this, it makes it only easier to cut. In a war of honor and righteousness, you destroy your duty to your people to retain your position? Argrave criticized. The words were mostly for show. Delbrun's resistance was only ceremony, Argrave suspected. Who is to say who is right or just? Delbrun questioned coldly. Vasco has ruled for 872 years. The realm has only prospered during this time, growing and expanding ever further. And yet it falters now. Argrave countered. Vasca's king is ruthless and uncompromising, sowing misery where he dreads. Its heir is worse yet, cruel, taking pleasure in suffering. We all swear fealty to the king. Delbrun shook his head. I bear the title of count only by his grace. And the king swore to protect you in turn. At this, he fails miserably, indeed. He actively harms your people and your realm in vain glorious grasps at power to strengthen House Vasca. Argrave leaned in, entwining his hands. Nothing is black and white, Count Delbrun. But do you recall a history where a villain won? Never, considering who writes it. Argrave unwound his fingers. Furthermore, should a new king be enthroned, with Parban as the sole decider, doubtless that new king would bestow you a title with equal, if not greater, grace. Their heated back and forth slowed for a moment as each stared the other down. Finally, Delbrun asked, you believe House Parban to be the victors? Argrave was tempted to confess that things looked dire without just said or neutrality, but doing so would damage his position in the exchange. Unnecessary death is always a tragic thing. Whether it's Vaiden attacking Matath or Elbrail supporting Vasca, both create only havoc. You won't experience much of it. The people will, though. Your soldiers, your civilians. They'll bear the brunt. Argrave pursed his lips. I stopped what was beginning in Matath before it could spiral out of control. I cannot stop this civil war. I hope that, by facilitating this, the war can end quickly with a crushing victory. Yet Parban cannot protect their own. Word came today that five men under Prince Indian stormed a castle and killed its lord. This was in House Parban's territory no less. Delbrun waved his hand. Argrave frowned, ignorant of this happening. Realizing his mistake, he smoothed his face and deflected quickly, saying, An assassin can achieve much if the receiver is unprepared. If this does not illustrate Vasca's treachery thoroughly, I am unsure what will. Delbrun returned to the silence he'd cultivated at the beginning of the conversation staring at Argrave. His gaze was lost in deliberation, and Argrave waited for him to process things. You wish to speak of coercion? Argrave continued. Vasca has practically forced Elbrail into support. The Duke fears reprisal on account of being so close to the bulk of Vasca's power, and Vasca has leveraged that fear well with minute rewards. Argrave shook his head as though disappointed. I believe that, in times like these, it is a vassal's place to advise their liege to take a different, 
more mutually beneficial course of action. Elaine placed her hand on the table. The Order of the Grey Owl presently maintains its politically neutral stance under the leadership of Master Castro. Individual mages, however, are free to hold their own allegiances. As are the nobility of Jast. Something you might wish to consider, Count Delbrun. Delbrun did not look at Elaine, eyes staying locked on Argrave. Another matter, Argrave held Delbrun's gaze. Your brother, Valadrian of Jast. I am well aware there exists some hostility between the two of you. He pointed two fingers at each of them. Elias, though, is rather impressed by his talents. Should this betrayal occur, perhaps Valadrian might, as a show of good faith, renounce his family name and enter into service under Elias. Ha! Delbrun laughed once, a smile splitting his stern demeanor for the first time in the conversation. Stain had been watching passively throughout the whole conversation, but that brief laughter made his face shift. It was like watching some last holdout fall, some last hope that, just maybe, his brother still had some love for him. The teenager's gaze drifted to the floor, as though his triumph was stolen from him. You came well prepared, Argrave. Delbrun watched Argrave, uncaring of his younger brother's plight. You wear your house's colors, yet you work against their interests. A rather baffling thing. I do not like proceeding with uncertain variables. Where is your stake in this? Argrave touched the gold fur on his coat. I merely like these colors. There is no deeper meaning behind it. This outfit is rather nice, by my estimation. Argrave adjusted his clothing. As for my stake, Argrave searched for an answer. Brows furrowed. I was being genuine earlier. A loss of life is a tragic thing, to be prevented by any means necessary. If war cannot be stayed, let it end quickly. The war has not yet begun and both sides seem even, but should Vasca keep power, things will be unpleasant for the populace, largely. If those ruling are unjust, it is the people's duty to step up and remove them from power. There are others more suitable to the throne, with a claim to it or no. This was his true position on the matter. Should the rebellion succeed and should Argrave possess a pivotal position in said rebellion, he would be in a good position to enthrone a new ruler without significant unrest. He might achieve a better end than existed in Heroes of Berenda. Not all deviations from the normal course needed to be negative. Even a game as dynamic as Heroes of Berenda was not without limits in terms of options, and now those limits were gone. Delbrun nodded. If you phrase it like that, I think I see. I am glad to hear it. Now, then, unless you have more questions, all present are very eager to hear your answer. Argrave placed his elbows on the table and leaned against it. Delbrun shook his head. This is not something I, alone, can decide. I must consult with my vassals, few though they may be, and ensure that everything is considered before making such a decision. If you can't decide here, we'll take your answer as a no. Elias spoke up and Argrave hid his smile upon seeing a last disappointment. Evidently the young Lord of Parban did not like that Argrave's advice had been accurate. I do not like being forced to answer. Delbrun raised a hand to the table, gripping the side. Need I remind you that you are, nominally, our enemy? Argrave smiled. I have read the letters. We came here in good faith to try and pull you away from the path you're about to tread at the risk of Elias' life. I believe this is the least that you can do, Argrave stated seriously. You hold the most authority in just. Any decision you make will be followed. Delbrun's gaze locked on Argrave, resuming its silence. After a few moments, he looked to Elias and asked, You would give me, at the very least, until the end of this banquet, that. Elias paused. Should be fine, I think. Argrave hit his expression with his hand. Jesus, Elias. One job. Chapter 79, It Can't Happen. I see no reason to think that Delbrun would cheat us on this matter, Elias said with a determined stare at Argrave. He will give us his answer at the end of the banquet, just as he said. He still sat in the stone chair beside the table they'd spoken to Delbrun at. Argrave leaned up against the terrace's railing. Argrave sighed, rubbing the bridge of his nose with his thumb and forefinger. I wonder, then, why he can't be found anywhere in the banquet hall. Argrave lowered his hand. What did I tell you? I specifically told you not to let him answer later. I didn't think I needed to specify if the quantity of time was hours or days. Evidently I was wrong, Argrave said exasperatedly. Count Delbrun will come back, Elias insisted. Here's what I think will happen. Hours will pass and then the banquet will end. Servants will refuse us, citing some annoyance the Count must deal with, or perhaps he's simply fallen asleep in deep contemplation. Argrave shook his head. There's a term for this, stonewalling. You are too cynical, Elias said finally, refusing to argue the point further. Elias retainer, Helmut, seemed to share Argrave's sentiments, but he did not voice them. Fine, whatever. I did my best, Argrave shrugged in defeat. I don't think we're at risk anymore and Annalise will still be watching for suspicious happenings. Let us wait to see who is right. He looked to Stain, who sat at the table still. Stain. He called out, and the teenager raised his head. Argrave reached into his pockets, retrieving a small pouch. Here, well earned, he trusted. Stain caught the pouch, perplexed. He opened it, peering within, then quickly shut it and looked around. Gods, you have to stop carrying this much around, for rose gold coins. Hope you like it, Argrave said, 
falling into thought. Well, whatever happens, I'm no longer just. Stain pocketed the pouch. Every bit helps. I have to leave this place. Leave this city. I want to vomit. Try not to puke, please. Argrave advised idly, busy thinking. I think I can finish my business in just without a problem. Elbrail doesn't seem to intend to go public with his support of Vasca for a while yet. Argrave, began Elaine. Perhaps you might simply enjoy the rest of the banquet for what it is. Argrave lowered his gaze to meet Elaine's. He considered her point for a moment, then shook his head. The food is likely cold by now. The servants are adept. She countered, and I see something fine over there. Would you like to come? Sure, Argrave finally agreed. Elaine and Argrave walked back into the mostly empty banquet hall, heading to a table full of fine foods. Argrave looked around at the various foods, puzzled, before finally settling for a piece of bread with a shake of his head. I don't know what half of this stuff is, he commented, tearing the bread and taking a bite. Once he'd finished chewing, he commented, at the very least, this is certainly bread. You could try something new, she suggested retrieving a plate of strangely cut meat sloshed with some yellow sauce, and risk making a bad night worse, I'll stick to this any day. Argrave waved the bread about. Consistency is key. Hard to ruin bread. The night was not so bad. You speak well. I learned much about you. She stared at him. Most of it was made up. Argrave shook his head. I don't care what these people think of me. I'd prefer they didn't think of me. That would be best. I must say, I have never been asked to a banquet on business before. She looked around the hall. Would you prefer to have been asked for other reasons? He inquired taking a bite of bread. Generally, no, she shook her head, and then fixed her red hair. Were it you, though, I think I would have liked it very much. Argrave stopped chewing for a moment, tempted to break his rule of never speaking with food in his mouth. Elaine smiled at him as he chewed quickly, swallowing. He asked cautiously, are you being serious? If I am? She returned a question. That would be very surprising. Argrave set the bread down, feeling it was out of place for this conversation. It would be. Many men have tried to court me. I have considered some. And now, I am considering one in particular. Being confronted with this, Argrave could not help but size Elaine up. She was a beautiful woman, undoubtedly, bright red hair, unblemished skin, and enchanting green eyes. She had a certain fierceness to her face that betrayed some of her personality. The dress she wore tonight only served to accentuate her prominent features. She was a bright woman, too, a B-rank mage at her relatively young age. You want me to court you? Argrave asked but Elaine only crossed her arms and smiled. We have not known each other long. Why? Is that not the purpose of courtship, to get to know each other? She waved her hand towards him. You're intelligent, but you're not pretentious. You don't care about what my brother does to earn money. That alone means more to me than you know. I know that you treat the people close to you well. Those two you would call friend, Annalise and Gilliman, are evidence enough of that. And I think that. I think I would like it very much if I was one of those people. Their case is a bit different, but... Argrave trailed off, lost in thought. He let the silence fester in the air for a time as his thoughts ran in his head. When his thoughts came to a conclusion, he turned to Elaine. Listen, you're a very beautiful woman, Elaine, but beyond only that, you're intelligent and ambitious. I would be lying if I said anything else. Her face grew a little tense. It doesn't sound as though you're about to say yes. Argrave scratched his cheek, wondering how best to phrase this. Let me ask you this. Could you, tomorrow, set aside everything that you've built and leave just to go wandering for years on end? This is no journey of self-discovery, either. Argrave cautioned. It will be a journey fraught with perils, and there will be no time for frivolities or luxurious amenities. What do you mean? She frowned. Just is but one stop in my long, long journey. I lingered here far longer than I wanted to. There is something that I have to do, something that I have to achieve. I might die. I almost expect it. Are you toying with me? She questioned somewhat indignantly. Argrave sighed and shook his head. If only. When I leave just, I'm headed to the burnt desert. I'll be crossing the mountains using the abandoned low way of the rose. You're being serious she realized, that's immeasurably dangerous, I know, I might take a more respectable road, but I need something there, Argrave shrugged, when my business in the burnt desert is done, I have to head to the northeast of Vasca, maybe you've heard rumors of the plague beginning there, Argrave smiled bitterly, it's more dangerous than this civil war, I believe, I have to quell it, my schizoaffective half-brother blessed by many gods will be the, provided nothing too strange happened, Argrave continued, waving his hands, after that, more, more, and more. I cannot rest. I cannot afford it. All the money in my pocket can't buy the time I need to fix this continent's misery. I see. Then, that earlier, was you. She trailed off. How long will you do this? Three years and some months, as a rough estimate. Argrave stated plainly, leaning up against the table. You see, now, why your offer is difficult for me to accept. She turned away from Argrave, arms crossed as she lost herself in thought. Eventually, her green eyes fell back upon Argrave. I felt that you were being especially considerate of me. Was I wrong, then? Argrave was taken aback. It was true. He had been nicer to her than most, 
but that was only to ensure she caused no problems. He had wanted a transactional relationship more than a genuine one. In the end, she had been a great help. The matter with Roe, recommending Annalise as an honorary member to the Order of the Grey Owl, and showing up here today. You weren't wrong, he stated hesitantly. She seemed hopeful given his answer. Then, when all is said and done, when those three years have passed, she said the words slowly, as though she herself found them ridiculous. People started to enter the banquet hall quickly, led by servants. Argrave looked around perplexedly, it seemed as though all of the guests had had been led back. Elaine shifted uncomfortably on account of their privacy being so quickly disturbed. The doorway opposite the entryway opened once more, and Count Del Brown stepped out. Beside him was an ashen-haired woman with orange eyes. She was slender and seemed rather meek in front of the crowd. Everyone, Count Del Brown called out. I apologize for having my servants retrieve you all so suddenly. I have a very important announcement to make. Elias came out the door just behind them. Del Brown ushered him in, until the two stood side by side. As of today, I am very proud to announce a union of two great noble houses. My sister, Rydia of Jast, is now the betrothed to Elias of Parban, heir to the Margravate. Del Brown smiled, and clasped Elias' shoulder. Argrave's mouth fell open. He could not help but say, What? His voice was rather clear in the silence of the hall. Very quickly, though, clapping drowned out his voice. Hash. So, he spurned her, said Ilnor setting the teacup down. It seems to be that way, my princess, a maid said, lowering the paper. The princess was surrounded by many maids, each of them with papers in hand. They seemed more like bureaucrats than servants as they were, the maid continued, adding, the remainder of Elaine's writings only reports what we already know, just is allied to house Parban. The maid straightened the papers. It is unfortunate she could not grow closer to him. Not necessarily. Elnor pulled at the blindfold hiding her empty eye sockets, briefly exposing scarred flesh. I believe her affection was genuine. She would not have cooperated had he agreed. The maids looked among each other, uncertainty clearly on their mind. None voiced their concerns, though. Should we send Elaine the usual payment we provide for new informants? No. Elnor shook her head. Pay her generously. Make sure she knows we are being generous. Compensate Rivian, too, for his part in this. Are you sure, princess? Money is tight after recent investments. One of the maids asked. The princess remained unoffended by the questioning of her judgment. These investments will pay for themselves in months. There is money to be made in war, one needs only to be flexible. We will be fine, my little wings, fret not. This bat is not yet done soaring. Most present nodded in quiet acquiescence. The princess mused aloud. I did not think I had another competent brother. The maids looked amongst themselves, somewhat surprised. Their princess did not give praise easily. He killed my designs in infancy, she noted passively more an observation than anything. Unknown motivations, unknown allegiance, and many more unknowns. I am decidedly perplexed. Elaine thinks he wishes to be king, one of the maids noted. He plans to achieve great fame for various deeds, all the while aiding the rebellion. I'm not sure. Perhaps she misunderstood him, or she's trying to mislead me deliberately. Ilna scratched at her chin. I need to think. I need to plan. She fumbled briefly for the teacup, and then took another drink. Set the rest of the documents aside for now. Fetch my prosthetic feet. I must walk to work my mind lest my thoughts escape me. She shifted in her wooden wheelchair. The maid stood rapidly, scattering, leaving Elnor in quiet. How sad, the princess whispered aloud in the empty greenhouse. None but her could know what she was referring to. Chapter 80, Wrapping Up The worst part about Elias being correct had to be the fact that he wasn't smug about it. Argrave had come to realize were it anyone less decent. Argrave was sure they'd be rubbing his error in judgment in his face, and he'd be able to confront it squarely. A week had passed, and yet Argrave could still not feel unbothered by it. House Just and House Parban had entered into an alliance. Elias would soon be returning to Parban to get his father's approval, alongside a contingent of mages sworn to Just's service. The true effects of that pact would surely be felt in the days to come as it spread throughout the land. Argrave would need to see if Elbrail did indeed fall in with the rebels as he and Annalise had theorized. He had many doubts regarding whether or not things would proceed as planned, but he tried not to dwell on them. As Argrave had come to understand, many things were beyond his control. Yet the uncertain future was not the sole thing disturbing Argrave. Elaine seemed content to never again bring up what she'd mentioned at the banquet, and Argrave was not exactly eager to broach the subject. It had made the business between Roe and Elaine a good deal more awkward. Why are you sulking, boy? Roe's voice broke Argrave's thoughts. Bothered you're still dealing with my requests? Argrave, who was sitting in a chair, looked up to the aged elf. He had not especially liked Roe in the game, mostly because he was very difficult to fight. Roe alone was hard enough, but the fight was cheap. Two on one, Roe and his dragon, Crystal Wind. Now, after some time spent with him, Argrave started to view him as a senile old uncle with outdated ideals. It was difficult to dislike that. They were in the Vib El Manor. Argrave was waiting for Elaine to return from the bathroom so that things could proceed. Glimmon was busy at the blacksmith, finalizing the refaging of his armor, and Annalise remained at their inn, 
wrapped up in study. Argrave rubbed his hands together. How could I be bothered by that? It seemed like things were wrapping up. We've worked out an equitable illicit exchange of knowledge between Just and Veiden. I'm sure your pride as an honorable Veidiman must be direly wounded. Ro grinned. Despite his age, he had a rather clean set of teeth. To think that Driz thought this would be difficult, Argrave frowned. Meaning what? Driz is a smart man. I don't say this lightly. Ro tapped his staff against the ground, and then pulled up a chair. I didn't come here to tour your continent, looking at your ridiculous gaudy enchanted architecture. Ro waved his hand. This deal was precisely the reason I came here. Argrave was perplexed. What are you talking about? This is what you wanted all along? Argrave leaned back in the chair crossing his arms. Why not just ask? Seems simpler. Driz knew if I came to you, asking to set up contact between me and an influential person in this city, you'd wring us dry. Money, books, whatever other damnable things you can conjure in that dome of yours. Ro shook his head, lips curled. So, Driz gave me some lines, instructed me to lead you to where he wanted, and, well, here we are. Smart, be stingy with a guy fighting against everyone's enemy. Argrave nodded trolly. You seem to misunderstand something. Ro leaned his staff against the wall, and then pulled his chair a touch closer towards our grave. To Druz, you were merely the one who made him aware of he who would judge the gods. You made all of Veiden aware of his coming. Ro shook his head, to the patriarch, and to Veiden, that is the end. You do not matter. If you die, our fight continues. Whatever you achieve is of no consequence. At best, you could facilitate an easier landing on Berinda. Our grave was a bit offended at first, but his reason shone through and he accepted Ro's words with a quiet nod. Even if you've a god at your back. Driz doesn't see what you can reasonably achieve as one man. Despite the two formidable allies following you about like little ducklings, you're not much to him. He's only one person, too. Why is he forgetting that? Argrave shook his head, then examined something about the way Ro was speaking. You're separating yourself from them, Argrave noted. You're not saying we, but Driz or Veiden. Unfortunately, I can't disregard you. You seem to worm your way into important people's ears with ease. Not just that, your mana grows too quickly, for reasons I cannot understand. Ro veritably grumbled. Argrave had not made the existence of the Amaranthine heart known to any outside of Annalise and Gilliman. After all, when you aren't doing something to benefit yourself or your companions, all you do is read spell books. At the very least, you have aptitude and drive. You remind me of others I've known. More talented than me, more hardworking than me. That girl with you, Annalise, is one of those number. Ro gripped his staff. They're mostly dead, though. Some I watched die, some I killed when they overreached. Don't forget that. Talent and hard work cannot bring you everything. Real heartwarming talk, Ro, Argrave said exasperatedly. What's your point? Don't get stupid. Don't get cocksure, he said sternly. Had I the time, and were you less insufferable, I might teach you some things. As it stands, your jokes make my head ache and I'm to be very busy dealing with that red-haired one. What's her name? Elaine. He came to his feet using his staff to lift himself up. I'll say it plainly. Keep as you are. But know your limits. One mistake, one misstep, and you might end all your progress. You can't restart life, boy. Argrave blinked, taking in Rose's words. This is a very strange way to express concern. Whatever. I've said my piece. Live or die. It's not my concern. It's yours. We probably won't speak again for some time. I understand most of your business is near done in just. That's. Argrave was about to confirm. But the door opened and Elaine re-entered. Apologies, she said, adjusting her grey robes. I believe we were finalizing things? She questioned, tone completely businesslike. Right, Argrave agreed, standing up. Argrave thought that it would be for the best if they continued like this, ignoring what had been said. At the very least, things could continue as they were. Hash. Here are the first two outfits, the tailor introduced obsequiously. She was a short woman with neatly cut short brown hair. It was very pleasant to work with such strange dimensions. A tall, thin figure like yours. Uncommon, as you requested, I left room in case your physique should change somewhat. The lady, too, was an enjoyable challenge, she gestured to Annalise. Both of the outfits had been laid out across the table, likely because they had no mannequins that could reasonably fit either size. Argrave stepped forward, removing his gloves. Both leather outfits were a dark steely grey, lined with white at points subtly. Argrave could faintly feel the enchantments as he ran his hands across it. It consists of a base, leather boots, leather pants, and a leather shirt long sleeve. Over top that, you may wear a heavier duster lined with fur on the inside, in case the weather should grow cold. Or if more protection is needed, it has a hood to protect the head, too. The tailor stepped up beside our grave as he examined their new gear. Each is made of leather and fur from the snowstrider bears in the north, very durable leather, shrugging off blades by itself. The fur is soft and warm, and mostly lines the inside. The enchantments, too, should ward off much magic. The materials and the enchantment you chose work well in tandem, sir. My compliments. The tailor nodded. Excellent work, Argrave said, withdrawing his hand. Annalise, it is. Very overwhelming, she said, 
staring at the outfit as though she were staring at a pile of gold. Oh, I do not mean this negatively. I am simply in awe, she quickly added. The tailor smiled amiably. The other set, then, this way, if you would. She led the two of them to another table. There, a black set waited. It was distinctly different in design from the other. Here it is. You mentioned that this would be for the burnt desert, sir and so I prepared it with this in mind. I took some liberties that I hope will not be contrary to your preferences. She grabbed some of the joints of it. It's made of the very breathable krell leather from the distant jungles, so I felt as though some areas could be blocked off to prevent sound from entering the boots or other parts of the clothes. Argrave grabbed the sleeve of the outfit, weighing it. Feels light. Indeed, sir, the tailor agreed. A very lightweight set. Just the same as the other, it consists of boots, pants, a shirt, and a duster. The duster will luckily be needed sorely in the burnt desert. I included some face wrappings, free of charge, she picked them up. The enchantments on this are split between protection against physical and magical attacks. All said, I think these outfits will serve you both for decades. You should wait until you see what we have to do before you make the judgment, Argrave said, and the tailor took it in jest and smiled. It was no joke, though. Argrave reached into his pocket and pulled free a bag. I'm very satisfied with your work. Here's the remainder of the payment. The tailor held out her hands receiving the bag. She opened it quickly. Ah. My apologies, sir, and meaning no offense, but I would like to count these. I understand. Your right to be cautious, Argrave dismissed. Go ahead. Thank you for your understanding, sir, the tailor bowed, then stepped away elsewhere. So, Argrave turned to Annalise. Thoughts? They look rather hardy. The first one, in particular, would be right at home in Vaiden. She looked back to it. I feel guilty that Gulliman receives no such thing. He's getting a killer sword and a dagger. He wears armor. Anyway, and if he gets hit, it matters less, Argrave shrugged. Annalise looked at him strangely. You, I'm not saying he's less important, but only that. Well, you know what I mean? He shook his head. He's got a unique constitution. A regular tough guy, that one. I understand, she nodded. Thank you very much for doing this. Even if you do not seem to expect it, you deserve gratitude. Yeah, I know, I'm a saint. Argrave waved his hands dismissively. The other thing, Elaine gave me this, for you. Argrave retrieved a silver badge and handed it to Annalise. What is this? She took it, moving it about. An owl? I, oh, this is that matter you mentioned earlier. She quickly put the pieces together. Congratulations, Annalise, honorary wizard of the Grey Owl. I will no longer be risking expulsion from the Order when I lend you the books from the library. Argrave clapped quietly. You can also enter the Order buildings without being suppressed by the myriad enchantments in the place. Argrave tapped the badge gripped in her hands. It's a blank canvas now but you should will some of your magic inside. It'll mark you as the owner. She nodded and did so. The badge shone. She held it up in the air, pointing it at our grave. Yet another thing to thank you for. Benefits me more than you. Like I said, no more risk of expulsion. Our grave shook his head. Well, we have but a few more things to do on my list. Our grave retrieved the paper, from which many things had been crossed out. We have the two enchanted rings to get. There's Glimmon's enchanted weaponry. Plus his enchanted arrows. Our grave briefly looked up to Annalise. See, he got plenty and after your list is over and done. Annalise pressed. Argrave lowered the paper, stashing it back away in his pockets. We buy what we need for travel, and we leave. Back to the road once more, she nodded, gaze distant as though preparing herself for that. Argrave shifted. I won't lie. Given your experience in the Thorngorge Citadel, the place we're going to next may be very difficult for you. The low way of the rose abounds with creatures made by the same Midgley order. These ones aren't impotent, though. These are well-oiled machines made by the order that far outlive their masters. Well-oiled? she questioned, meaning, er, uh, they're tried and tested, effective, meaning dangerous, they were intended to be patrolling guards for the underground roadways bridging the burnt desert to the lands of Vasca, Argrave turned his head to see the tailor returning, we've done a lot of preparation for this trek, whether it'll be enough, we'll have to find out, I will not see your journey stalled by my own issues, Annalise said resolutely, even if creatures resembling those at Thongorge Citadel should frequent this low way, I will overcome it, don't push yourself too much, Argrave advised, he was ignorant of Annalise's eye roll at his hypocrisy, we'll have to associate with a group called the Stone Apatal Sentinels, I'm not too sure about what to expect, if you like this audiobook, subscribe the channel for more videos like this, and join my Patreon if you want to support me, where you can find the complete collection Jekyll Among Snakes audiobooks, hurry up, what are you waiting for, leave some comment and let me know if you guys like this story, or you have a web novel you like and want to hear its audiobook, I will be happy to create them for you, please like, share and leave a comment on the video.